I wake up completely disoriented. It's pitch black out, and I'm swinging? What is that buzzing? Oh, yeah. I'm in a hammock on a jungle trek in the middle of the Amazon rainforest. Our guide repeated himself. Caras, é quase meia-noite. Vamos achar alguns jacarezinhos. That's Portuguese, in case you don't know. For guys, it's almost midnight. Let's go find some baby alligators. Bom, I said, vamos lá. Let's go. We tiptoed to our canoe and pushed off into the river. So how did I end up in this bizarre situation? Let's start from the beginning. I was born and raised just outside of Boston. And you may know that Boston has a pretty big Brazilian population. Growing up, some of my closest friends were Brazilian. Danny was one of them. He moved to Brazil, sorry, he moved from Brazil to Boston when he was just three, and we've been best friends ever since. You're going to see a lot of photos. So this is one photo of us 10 years ago uh, during this epic adventure that I will be describing. Uh, and we reunited in Brazil last year. Uh, this is New Year's in Rio de Janeiro on the beach at Copacabana, uh, which is about as awesome as it sounds. It was definitely a, a life highlight. Uh, everyone wears white. It's a, a very magical kind of spiritual uh, celebration called Heveillon. If you ever get a chance to go to Rio for New Year's, I would recommend it. Anyway, for the first 20 years of my life, I spent the vast majority of my time in Massachusetts. As I said, I grew up near Boston. I went to public schools there, K through 12. I spent 10 summers at a sleepaway camp in Western Mass. And for college, I went to Harvard, which was mostly great, but occasionally not. Sophomore year was one of the not times. I had a pretty serious sophomore slump. Basically, I got super stressed out about classes, and I also chose the wrong people to live with. Side note, be very careful if you can choose your roommates. See if, make sure that they're compatible, that's important. So by this point, I was 20. I'd hardly left Massachusetts at all beyond a few family vacations. Looking back, I can see that I was really living in a bubble, and I hadn't pushed myself out of my comfort zone much at all. Now, I kind of want to coin a phrase. Is, can, can we create a phrase together? Comfort bubble, sort of like comfort zone, breaking out of your bubble. We're going to create that now, OK? Um, so here's an example of, of my comfort bubble in action. Uh, my senior year of high school, I had a really great high school experience. Uh, and the deans said, you know what, Dave? We'd actually, uh, we've chosen you. The deans have chosen you to speak on behalf of the entire senior class for graduation. I'm not proud of my reaction. <laughs> my reaction was, no. <laughs> and I didn't even really think about it. Um, I was talking to my, my parents the other day when I was preparing for this. And I said, Mom, do you, do you remember that this happened? And they said, no, I don't think you told us about that. Um, I didn't tell any of my friends. I was so petrified of public speaking that within about 10 seconds, I said no. Um, and I kind of regret that. that. That was a missed opportunity there. And someone else gave a speech, and it was great. Um, and so one reason I, I wanted to do this is to uh, accept a public speaking opportunity. Uh, obviously, I've had a little more practice since then. So there were other examples I could go on and on about, but I, I played it pretty safe throughout high school and, and even in the early days of college. Um, I really wasn't taking too many healthy risks. I wasn't breaking out of that comfort bubble. So let's go back to sophomore year of college. We're jumping around a little. Um, I had this slump, and I, I realized you know, I need a change of scenery. By this point, I had decided I was going to major in history. Um, I had an idea I wanted to teach, but for now, I really wanted to explore. And so I ended up choosing Rio de Janeiro to study abroad. Now, you may be asking, why did I choose Rio? Well, first off, I mean, come on. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. Anyone been to Rio before? It's, it's incredible. So this is the famous uh, Corcovado statue, uh, the, the Jesus Christ who is sort of welcoming people with open arms. He's facing east. Um, and it's a, a dramatic and, and really gorgeous view. Um, you can see the, the Sugarloaf Hill in the background, the Deutsche Romans, which we'll see more of in a second. Um, here is another photo. This is also from this trip, uh, the title slide, as you saw. So this is the Deutsche Romans uh, Hill here, the two brothers. Uh, you can just barely make out. That's the Jesus statue there. Um, so I am facing south right now. Uh, this is Ipanema Beach here. And th this is one of those things where I have to pinch myself and think of how lucky I was. I was actually living right there during my study abroad. Uh, I, I was very fortunate to live in one of the most gorgeous places on Earth. 
So that was obviously one reason. Uh, Brazil is beautiful, Rio in particular. Um, here's another spot in Brazil. Uh, this is actually uh, outside of Rio. It's called Iguaçu Falls. Um, and there's a famous quote, Eleanor Roosevelt went there and she famously said, poor Niagara. And it's supposed to be, I haven't been, but it's supposed to be 10 times better and bigger and, and more dramatic than Niagara Falls. Um, of course, Danny and his family were big influences on me choosing Brazil. Um, I also found a pair of really great programs. There was an intensive summer school program that led right into an immersive fall semester. Um, I also did some research and I learned that if you get a good research grant, um, and if you hunt around for different programs, you can actually save money studying abroad. Um, you, have, you have to research, obviously, and it also helps to kind of go off the beaten path. If you're going to Europe, if you're going to London, Paris, et cetera, it's probably going to be more expensive. If you go somewhere uh, a little more alternative, you can definitely save some dough. And what was really cool is I started learning, wow, Brazil's culture and history are just so fascinating. Um, so there were all these great scholarly uh, presentations that we've heard. I, I had to do a little research myself. So we're going to do four fun facts on Brazil. Uh, fact number one, Brazil has the world's seventh largest economy, its fifth largest population, and it actually has a land mass larger than the continental U.S. So you can see the map of Brazil overlaid on the U.S. here. Um, Rio in the southeast is, of course, where I was studying abroad. Sao Paulo is the largest city by some measures. Uh, the largest city in all of the Americas, maybe 20 million greater. Uh, Brasilia is the capital, and Manaus is right in the thick of the Amazon where most of this story will take place. I think we are probably right about there, uh, really in the middle of nowhere in northern Brazil. Fact number two, Brazil is incredibly diverse. It actually has the largest African population outside of Nigeria, the largest Japanese population outside of Japan, and believe it or not, more Lebanese people than anywhere including Lebanon. Amazing. Um, researchers have shown that about one-third of marriages in Brazil are interracial, which is the highest rate in the world. Fact number three, Brazilians love their sports. Uh, you probably know that Rio will host the Olympics next summer, um, and of course Brazil hosted the World Cup last summer, and, or two summers ago, I guess, in 2014. Um, Brazilians, above all, love soccer. Uh, or as they call it there, the Jogo Bonito de Futebol, the beautiful game of football. Oh, and by the way, I meant to mention, uh, if you see this little Brazilian flag in the corner, that means I didn't take that photo. I've got to cite my sources here as a good history teacher. Um, and uh, Brazil uh, has a long history of uh, soccer dominance. Uh, if you look at the Brazilian jersey here, there you go. There are five stars right there. And there's one star for every championship, Brazil won, which is the most of any country. Fact number four, talking about the Amazon. So 60% of the Amazon rainforest is in Brazil. It's going to be that, that region right there. And the rainforest is sometimes called the lungs of the earth, right? It's larger than Europe. It's an enormous swath of territory. And one in 10 of all known species reside there. So as you heard from my introduction, I'll be teaching uh, Brazilian history class. This is my fifth year uh, teaching it, and of course my first one here. So there's a little sneak preview of the, the things that we will discuss and study there. That's the end of my uh, shameless plug. <laughs> so after finishing my sophomore year of college, uh, this is July 2005, just over a decade ago, I shipped off to Brazil for seven straight months of study abroad. Uh, this was summer into junior fall into the winter. Um, and looking back, this was a pretty risky move. Um, I'd never been to Brazil before. I'd heard about it a lot, but I'd never been. Um, also, the longest time I'd ever studied abroad was one week, or excuse me, the longest time I'd been abroad was just one week, and now I was going for 30. So th this was a bit of a leap of faith. Uh, the first six months in Rio really just flew by. Here are a couple highlights. Um, I worked really, really hard to learn Portuguese. I took six years of French, never clicked for some reason. Um, but Portuguese, I just really enjoyed it. It was fun. Uh, there's something about living in the country that makes it a lot easier to learn. Um, I also learned how to do this. we got to get a better one. Right? And so this is actually, believe it or not, a part of the Portuguese language. Um, and it, it, it's used for emphasis. It's used if you want to really say, like, oh, that was so cool. Did you see that goal that Neymar just scored? Or scored right? Um, it's a really useful gesture. Uh, if you, if you want to learn after, I can try to teach you. Um, I also started researching my senior, senior thesis. Uh, if you don't know 
what a senior thesis is, uh, your last year in college, you can write a really big uh, in-depth research paper. Um, I, I went, I, I rambled a little. It was about 175 pages total. I got really into the topic. Um, I got to, oh, there's more, Amazon. I got to dig through some centuries old uh, newspapers, um, digging through microfilm, uh, which was re it was probably one of the hardest things I've ever done, but it was so fascinating. Uh, and it was all about this naval revolt that happened in 1910 in Rio. So at times I was definitely homesick during this study abroad experience. Uh, I had growing pains for sure, but I can honestly say this was the richest six months of my life. I learned so much. Uh, I was really able to realize just how much of a bubble I was in. Uh, for the first time, I shopped and cooked for myself. Uh, I took care of my own finances. I traveled on my own. I also really had to start from scratch in terms of making friends, which was pretty scary in a foreign country. Uh, I had to make a whole new social network. Uh, and these are life skills that I use every day today. Uh, I feel like I, I really grew so much. Um, and just to step back, I think here at UPREP, it's really important that we remember we're, we're in our own comfort bubble here, right? This school, this neighborhood, this city, this state, this country, they're not quite representative of the full world. And that's why I think it's so important to, to break out of that. Um, and if I can make a, another plug, I'd say studying abroad or spending extended periods of time in a foreign country can be so valuable. You know, a week-long vacation, it's good, it's a start, but it's, there's something about when you get to the two, three, four-week month, uh, or month-long mark, right, that you start to, to notice things that, that you may not have noticed before. Uh, you get outside, you talk to strangers, you try weird new foods, you go on random adventures. That's really how you learn and grow and stretch yourself. So you're probably saying, Mr. Marshall, get to the Amazon already. You hooked us in the beginning. So let's get to that. Um, by now it's January 2006. This is almost, almost exactly 10 years ago. Um, I finished my six months of studying abroad in Rio, and now I had just six wide open weeks. Um, and it was kind of a no-brainer at this point. Danny and I, we had to meet up. He goes there every Christmas to see his family. I would always miss him during Christmas because he'd be gone. And this time we would actually get to explore. And we, we were plotting this. We were planning this for months. So we did Rio de Janeiro, of course. We did Sao Paulo, where he's from. Uh, we did Salvador in the Northeast. Uh, we did Uro Preto, which is one of my all-time favorite cities. It's this gorgeous colonial town. Um, but the highlight was definitely our week together in, Amazon, in the Amazon. And we decided we wanted to do something totally off the beaten path, you know, not touristy at all. And here's the group we ended up choosing. So that's me, age 20. That's Danny. He's 21. Uh, this guy, Hobson, he was our guide. He was 20. He was younger than we were. <laughs> so we essentially entrusted our life to this random stranger uh, who did not speak a lick of English, um, but he could not have taken any better care of us. And so we went to the office, and I don't think you can really call it an office. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a space, we'll, we'll call it that. Um, and we got there, and he said, you guys are the only ones who signed up. And we said, uh, okay, can we still have the tour? He said, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, do you mind if I bring my girlfriend? And we said, yeah, sure, why not? She seems nice. So this, this was our entire tour. <laughs> that was the whole tour there. This is not, they have these luxury uh, tours. We were not doing that. This was definitely uh, off the beaten path. So this was a really cool tour. Uh, we flew into Manaus on the north. We took two different buses for about six hours, and they were bumpy, and one was about that tall, so there weren't seats, and I had to kind of crouch the whole time. Um, then we took a motorboat for an hour, then we got on these two rickety canoes, and we rode our way. We were deep in the jungle. We went about three days without seeing any humans beyond each other. It was also really scary. Like, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I was scared a lot early on, especially at night. And I still remember that first night. Uh, we didn't have any sort of shelter. We just kind of hung hammocks, right? And has anyone been to the Amazon before? It, it's loud, right? Like, especially at night, there are 50 different insects and there are weird croaks. And what is that? Is there a jaguar circling around? Oh, my God. It, it, it's alive. The, the Amazon really is alive. I'd never slept in a hammock before, and I was... I was freaking out a little bit. That first night, I maybe slept a couple hours. Um, it, it, was, it was a little nerve-wracking. I was definitely breaking out of my comfort zone. Um, the next day, I mean, Hobson, he worked us hard. We were basically hiking all around. We were canoeing to random places. We were just constantly trying to find different wildlife. And for the rest of the trip, I was just so exhausted, I, I slept like a baby. So after that first night, uh, I was doing OK. Uh, the rainforest, it was enchanting. We were trying to figure out what, what would do that 
to a leaf. It, tiny little bugs or something. Um, just some of the coolest trees you'll ever see. I'm going to warn you, this next slide is a little disturbing. That is a tarantula. Uh, Hobson was insistent that we find one, so he was digging around for, <laughs> for like over an hour. He was digging into these holes, and we're like, you're going to get yourself killed, but he, he knew what he was doing. Okay, no, no more tarantula. You can look back. Um, he knew everything about the rainforest. Now, I have a really bad sense of direction. He didn't need any GPS. He didn't need a compass. There wasn't even a trail most of the time, and it didn't matter. Uh, I wish I had a picture of this. My enduring mental image of Hobson is in one hand he had a jug of water, like a big gallon jug, and the other hand he had a machete. <laughs> and, and he was not threatening anyone or anything. He used it to basically hack away the vines to make a path. Um, th this guy helps and he, he was not to be messed with. Um, speaking of vines, let's see if we can get this uh, video to work. <laughs> so <laughs> we all we all took a turn uh, swinging on that vine. It was pretty cool. Felt like Tarzan. Um, now I, I would say that no animals were harmed during this trip, but first the mosquitoes were everywhere, and we debated should we take malaria meds or not. Danny's a doctor now, his parents are doctors. We ended up not taking them, but that meant every time there was a mosquito, we were freaking out <laughs> and trying to kill it. Um, we also went fishing, and one of the most common fish in the Amazon is the piranha. Um, so this is actually a piranha that I cut. Sorry, that's a little gross too. Um, we'll, we'll go back to a nice photo here. But <laughs> the uh, piranhas actually taste pretty good if you ever get a chance. Um, so during our fifth day, Hobson asked us, he said, do you guys wanna, you wanna find some baby alligators? Now, Danny is the adventurous one between the two of us. So his, his response was, oh, quite a casino. Yeah, of course, let's do it. I was a little more reluctant, and I asked a couple questions, and I said, you know, how dangerous is it? And, you know, what are the chances we find one? What are the chances we get, you know, eaten, maybe? Um, and eventually he convinced me, and I said, you know what, when in Rome, or I guess when in the Amazon at this point, and, and I said, let's do it. But the catch was the best time to find these alligators is at midnight, literally. So we took a long nap because we were pretty exhausted, and then that's when he woke us up around 11.30. Uh, we were in our hammocks, and uh, we you know, sort of quietly went into those uh, wobbly canoes. Or actually, we just took one canoe so we could move more quickly. So here's our mission. We had to find a baby alligator without the mom finding us. This is a little scary, not going to lie. Um, you could barely see 10 feet in front of you. I mean, there was zero light pollution. We're probably 100 miles away from anything else. Uh, we had two flashlights. Um, mine was basically about to die. It was sort of flickering in and out. And then Hobson had this really intense mag light that a uh, little Star Wars reference. It, it was like a lightsaber, basically. It was pretty cool. Um, Hobson, he was this master Jedi canoeer. So he had all these crazy strokes that I'd never seen. So he was rowing, and then Danny and I were trading off you know, the, the weak one and the lightsaber. And we probably just went in circles for about two hours, um, just looking, looking, and I was just jumping everywhere. Oh my God, are we going to get chomped here? Um, but eventually, we found one. Right? It kind of looks like a, a stick there. And Hobson somehow was able to wrangle this baby alligator into the canoe. And now, this is when I turn to Danny and I go, Oh, I'm with the leg, I'm with the leg, look at that. Right? And then he says, Shh, don't, don't, we don't want the mom in here. So she was about 20 inches head to tail. She was scaly, she was pretty light, uh, and she was just writhing. She was just squirming all over the place. You know, her, her life, in, in her eyes, her life was at stake. And she was just doing everything to escape. And this actually wasn't that scary. She, she, he said, oh, let her bite you, it's fine. She didn't have any teeth. She was totally harmless, kind of cute, right? It, it almost looked like one of those fake plastic animal things, but obviously it was real. Um, and that's when Hobson pulled out his secret weapon. He had all of these little tricks up his sleeve. Um, he turned her over and, you know, firmly but gently held her and then started just stroking its belly. And it was riding a little, but then it was slowing down. And within about 30 seconds, he actually used a sleeper move and put the baby alligator to sleep. And, and Danny and I were just incredulous. We, did this, is this actually happening right now? <laughs> now, I know this sounds made up, so let me show you the, uh, the video. It's pretty 
pretty cute, right? <laughs> so we, we, you know, passed it around. We took this video, photos, of course. And then Hobson said, you know, we should probably get going before the mama alligator comes. And we said, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's get out of here. So we gently put her back into the Amazon. Uh, we paddled back to our hammocks, and, and thankfully, we made it back in one piece. So looking back, I, I can really see I learned so much from that week in the Amazon. I learned even more from my seven months studying abroad in Brazil. I honestly can say I learned more during those seven months than I learned in all my three and a half years at Harvard or really anywhere else. What was my biggest lesson? Well, I really think if you want to learn, if you want to grow, you need to take healthy risks. You need to break out of your comfort bubble. If you do this, you can learn so much about the world and maybe more importantly, you can learn about yourself, too. I know that I did. Here's the thing. So you may be thinking, how am I ever going to make it to some far off land? You can do that right here at UPREP. There are all sorts of ways you can break out of your comfort zone here at UPREP. And that way, when you really do have to take a risk, like you know, chasing baby alligators in the Amazon, you'll be ready. Thank you. <laughs>